Thank you so much for joining us for our first ever Bats and Churches live session. Um, my name is Claire Boothby and I am the Training and Surveys Officer for the Bats and Churches project. So um, for those of you who are quite new to Bats and Churches, um, we're a five-year National Lottery Heritage Funded project um, with the aim of um, coming together to find solutions um, to help Bats and Churches live more harmoniously together. Now, as you can imagine, a lot of our work with churches has been put on hold at the moment during the lockdown. So it's really good that we can come together in this virtual format. So um, we're doing four events um, each Wednesday lunchtime in May. And in this one, we're putting the spotlight on our British bats. Um, so to do this, I'm joined by the fantastic Lisa Wallage, who's the head of conservation services at BCT, at Bat Conservation Trust. And I'm also joined by the fantastic Philip Briggs, who is the monitoring manager of the National Bat Monitoring Programme, also run by Bat Conservation Trust. So um, both Lisa and Philip will provide a, a few short talks on um, an introduction to bats, how they live, and importantly, how they're faring here in the UK. And um, there will be a chance to ask questions. So um, please do get the questions coming in, either via the Q&A um, format on Zoom, or through Twitter, if you'd prefer, using the hashtag Bats in Churches Live. Um, before we begin, um, just if anyone's having any technical issues, apparently the best thing to do is to log out and then back in again, and hopefully that will um, solve any problems that you have. Um, so without further ado then, um, Lisa, can I hand over to you to give us a short introduction to the wonderful and mysterious world of um, bats? Thank you ever so much, Claire. Um, let me just share my screen with you. Lovely. Hopefully you can all see um, the slide in front of you. This is indeed a very brief introduction to the, um, the amazing uh, group of animals that are, um, that are bats. Um, bats are unique. They are mammals, so they have fur, they suckle their young. And although typical in these ways, they are unique amongst other mammals in their power of true flight, as we can see in this lovely um, photograph of the serotine, one of our native species. And you can see those elongated finger bones that give us the structure for wings. Now, all bat species belong to the order Chiroptera, and this is a scientific name for the group. It comes from Greek and it literally means hand wing, which is a great description. And I saw a lovely um, post on social media that said that bats fly through the power of jazz hands. Bats are an ancient group. They'd become a clearly separate order by the end of the Cretaceous around 65 million years ago. So the first bats were probably around when dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Um, and this is an incredible time span when you think about the great apes only separating from other primates 15 million years ago. So 50 million years later. Now, a lot of people say bats are flying mice. They are not. Um, they're not closely related to rodents at all. And some of their names in other languages don't help us. So we have chauve souris or bald mouse in French. We have flader mouse or flying mouse in German. But these, these common names are, are just incorrect. Bats are actually more closely related to horses, whales, and even pangolins than they are to mice. In fact, humans are more closely related to rodents than bats are. Now, bats are global, and like many groups of plants and animals, species diversity is richer around um, the tropics. But bats are found on every continent with the exception of Antarctica. And there's even one species of bat that's found north, um, up 70 degrees north, so within the Arctic Circle, the northern bat. Bats are incredibly diverse. We now have over 1400 species around the world with new species still being discovered. They account for 20% of all mammals by species. 
They come in all shapes and sizes, from the tiny bumblebee bats of Thailand to the five foot wingspan of the large flying fox. Some, like this wrinkle faced bat you can see in the pictures, have looks that probably only their mothers could truly love. Whereas our huddle of the little four Honduran white bats are like a little adorable balls of cotton wool and are much more appealing, perhaps. In the UK, we have 18 species of bats recorded as resident. The most recent addition, um, just 10 years ago in 2010, was the Alcathoe bat, um, which is quite impressive really to add a new mammal species in a country where there's so much um, biological recording as we have. Um, but who knows what else will get added before um, I get to hang up my bat detector. Only 17 of our, our 18 species are, are breeding. Um, the 18th is, is, I'm sad to say, represented by a solitary, um, a solitary bat, a male in fact. It's the greater mouse-eared um, from a site down in Sussex. We have two families of bats represented here in the UK. We have um, the horseshoe bats, which are actually more closely related to flying foxes and their allies than they are to our other family, which is the Vespa bats. And in the last few years, in fact, for, for a while now, we've had occasional records for some other species that, that seem to be occasional visitors, such as Jeffroy's bat, Cool's pipistrelle, which is actually resident on Jersey, and, and occasional other species like party-coloured bats. Now, this image in front of you isn't a mother bat with her pup, but is actually showing a pipistrelle, one of our smallest bats, alongside a noctule, one of our largest. Now bats feed on all sorts of things from nectar drinking to frog eating, from blood drinking to moth munching. Bats actually feed on a wider group of foodstuffs than any other mammalian order. But all of our native species here in the UK eat insects, although of course different species will have different preferences for what they consume, um, as well as different methods for detecting and, and catching their prey. And this is a noctual um, enjoying a moth. Now, all of our native UK bats use echolocation to find their way around. And this is basically them shouting out and listening to the sounds bouncing back from their environment. So from trees and buildings so they don't fly into them, but also importantly from that insect prey that they, um, they want to eat. Now, bat calls are very high frequency for them. So for the most part, they're above human hearing, although um, some children and, you know, some social calls are perhaps a bit more audible. But it's possibly a good job that we can't hear all bat calls at night because one of our loudest species, or back to the nocturne again, um, it actually can echolocate at um, a decibel level that's above the legal limit for a nightclub. So it's pretty good that we can't hear those sounds above our houses at night. Now, we can use bat detectors that will translate those high frequency calls and bring them down into a frequency range that we can hear from or that we can um, make recordings from. And this can also help us work out which species we're listening to. Bats are, are long lived and one of the oldest recorded bats was a, was a Brant's bat, which is a very small bat, only a few grams. And it was recorded at 41 years old. It's um, a colony of brown long-eared bats shown in this picture um, and they typically may live just a few years in the wild but have been recorded up to 30 years and even our common pipistrelles with a, a lot of luck can live to 10 or even 15 years although typically it will be a much shorter much shorter time naturally. Um, interestingly, research has found from a, a ringing study, this is where a band's put on a bat's forearm um, to uniquely identify um, that individual, um, from a study in Oxfordshire where they looked at bat boxes and they looked at what bats were found with what other bats, and it turned out that bats have friends. They regularly were found with other, the same other bats. But, and these didn't have to be, you know, blood relations. So bats do indeed have friends. Bats also have pups, and this is a maternity um, roost of pipistrelle bats. Um, I'm sure you can spot the sort of pink um, pup there in, in the picture. And typically our native species will have one pup, occasionally two, but typically one pup a year. Now, that's probably no bad thing because 
pups can be up to a third of their mother's weight at birth. And apparently that's like a human mum giving birth to a five-year-old child. And I think that's enough to make any woman's eyes water. Now, bats have a, a yearly cycle, and in, it, certainly um, in our climate, and this helps them cope with the scarcity of insects um, over the winter months. So they're hibernating in winter when insect prey is less available, becoming more active in the spring. And as we come into the sort of time of year we are now in May, females are coming together in their maternity roosts and becoming pregnant. They'll have their pups um, over the summer, and then mating in the winter and sharing, um, sorry, storing fat ready for going, mating in the autumn, I beg your pardon, and then storing fat ready for going into the winter and through hibernation and the cycle starting all over again. Bats will roost in a, a variety of places, often changing their roosting locations across the year, typically somewhere different to spend the summer, and um, particularly for maternity colonies from where they'll spend the winter months. They'll use natural sites such as trees and caves, but also they've evolved to make use of many structures created by humans, houses, bridges, mines, ice houses, and of course, churches. Now I've got a little bit of video here to show you because bats can get into some quite small spaces. If you can get your index finger into a gap, then Crevice dwelling species like pipistrelles can get in. And at BCT, we often get calls to the National Bat Helpline um, from people who think um, they found baby bats, but have actually found adults. And you could get a pipistrelle bat into a small matchbox, but please, obviously, don't try that at home. Other species like horseshoe bats need to be able to, to fly in to their roosts if they're not able to crawl very well. Now this is um, a bit of video footage taken by Roger Jones down in Sussex. Um, it's a bit blurry, but hopefully you'll get the gist. Um, you can see the window of the house here and a little collection of, of droppings. We have timber on the outside of the house and tiles. And then this bit of lead flashing and you might see this gap here this is where you need to need to watch Hopefully you got a good sense there of bats squeezing themselves out the gap and that sort of wet slappy sound you could hear in the background was someone with a bat detector um, so you could actually hear the calls that the bats were making. It was translating those high frequency calls into um, our hearing range and that wet slappy sound is quite typical of pipistrelles. Now, bats aren't now where, the, where they were and horseshoe bats are a great example of just um, why all of our native species and their roosts are legally protected. If we go back, um, well not quite 200 years, 150 years, you can see um, the distribution here of greater horseshoes reaching right across to eastern or southeastern England and up into mid Wales. Whereas although horseshoe bats are, are doing better now, this, this is after these long years of decline in their population and their range distribution. So, Bats in the UK are hanging on, and Philip's going to give us some more information in a minute about um, the trends for our native species. But I just want to emphasise again that all the UK's bat species and their roosts are protected under British law. And this has actually been the case since 1981. Bats continue to face threats though, despite this protection. Um, threats from things like loss of roosting sites, um, disturbance of their roosts, loss of habitat, loss of food, for a whole variety of reasons. It's also important to consider 
bats and people and there's a lot of fear and intolerance around bats there's something of the other something of the something of the night um, people can dislike the idea of bats in their rooms and even though they're protected can can try to remove them but i hope this talk has helped you understand just how incredible bats actually are now I could talk, I could take up all the time available to us talking about bats, but I shall resist the temptation because I know you'll, you'll be keen to hear from, from Philip as well and ask some questions, but you can find out more. There's the Bat Conservation Trust website there and also um, the Bats and Churches Project's own website. Um, now, no matter your level of interest, there's ways to get involved for absolutely everyone. And when we're allowed out to play again, um, I hardly recommend you make contact with your local bat group if you haven't already had the privilege of being out on a bat walk then I can't recommend it enough but that does come with a health warning I went on my first bat walk in 2008 and I started work at BCT just three years later and bats have pretty much taken over my life so um, but do go and enjoy a bat walk thank you oh Sorry, I realised also thank you. I should say thank you to all of the people who let us use their images and videos um, that would make our talks far more boring if we didn't have these fabulous pictures. So thank you to everyone listed and just a note there about the additional images um, sourced elsewhere. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was really, really interesting. And it's always impressive to really kind of, particularly the lifespan of such little mammals. It's just in, it's incredible. Um, we've had some questions coming in, so I'm just going to ask a couple now before I hand over to Philip. Um, before I do, I should have said at the beginning that we're aiming for this session to last about 40, 45 minutes, so um, until quarter to, quarter to two. Um, the first question that's come in, Lisa, is actually about lighting and whether or not that affects our bats. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, under the slide of threats, uh, I'm deliberately included an image of a, of a streetlight. You can see during the day what would otherwise be perfectly fabulous bat habitat, good hedgerows, for example, or, or other areas for bats foraging. And you go down the same route at night and you see that it's floodlit for security reasons. And certainly we have species that are very intolerant of light. There are some that are a bit more light adapted, so lighting can turn usable habitat um, into habitat that can't be used by bats. So lighting absolutely has an impact. And the Bat Conservation Trust, um, Joe Ferguson, our, our built environment officer, has been involved in putting together lighting guidance for use in areas where there, where there are bats with the uh, industry of lighting professionals and others. And you can find that on our website. Fantastic. Thanks. Th thanks, Lisa. Before I pass over to Philip, there's just I have time for one question now and then we'll have a, a bit longer for Q&A's after the talks. But um, someone has asked, um, is the bat life cycle in here different in other parts of the world than it is in Britain? Yeah, so we're, we're obviously a temperate climate. We have colder winters and warmer summers and bats have evolved to cope with that. But certainly in the tropics, um, where conditions are different, then, the, then bats don't hibernate. In fact, I've had reports from the bat group on the Isles of Scilly that they suspect that their bats don't always hibernate in winter because it can be really mild. Mm. So there is, there is a lot of variation geographically, but also in certain areas between species as well. So um, the thing to bear in mind is we tend to talk about bats as a whole, but we do have over 1,400 species globally. And so there is tremendous amount of variation, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so now I'm actually going to hand over to Philip, who will be talking a bit more about um, our British bats and how they've been faring and how that um, and how their populations have changed over time. So, um, Philip, over to you. OK. I'll share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see the first slide there. OK. Okay, so I'll start by looking at how bat populations have been changing in the longer term, so over the last hundred years based on available evidence. Okay, so I'll look at a few species, um, starting with the, the greater horseshoe bat, um, and evidence comes from a few different studies. Um, in 1988, 
uh, Bob Stebbings reported the loss of large colonies from traditional cave and mine roosting sites across Europe. And a long-term study by Roger Ransom showed that populations near Bristol declined by 70% between 1962 and 1988. And a review of British mammals carried out, out by Harris et al. in 1995 reported general historic declines for the species. And I should mention a caveat when looking at roost loss is that this will sometimes be due to the bats moving to a different roost that isn't being monitored, um, as well as um, populations declining. However, the evidence supporting these assessments also includes range contractions, um, such as Lisa showed earlier on for lesser horseshoe bat. Um, and despite a huge increase in biological recording effort, um, this species is no longer in, observed in areas where it used to be reported. And coming on to the closely related lesser horseshoe bat. Again, Harris reported um, long-term historical declines. But in 1910, Hamilton stated that the lesser horseshoe bat was common in many parts of the south of England from Kent westwards was widely distributed in the West and in Wales, and may be said with certainty to range as far as far north as Ripon in Yorkshire. And although the species is still widely distributed in Wales and southwest England, it is um, rarely found in, in other parts of the UK. So there really has been a big contraction of range. Um, the greater mousid bats, there's been uh, even more dramatic um, signs of decline. Again, Stebbings um, noted losses of large colonies from traditional cave and mine roosting sites across Europe. But sadly, Greater Mouthsed Bat was declared extinct in the UK in 1990, making it the first mammal to be declared extinct in the UK since the grey wolf in the 17th century. And the Nocturne, um, which we saw in Lisa's presentation, quite a large tree dwelling bat. Again, Harris et al. noted general historical declines. And a, a study in London by Pete Guest and others <clears throat> reported a decline between the mid-80s and 1999. <clears throat> and similar declines were noted for our most familiar species, the, the common and the soprano pipistrel. In 1972, the Mammal Society commissioned a questionnaire survey um, which uh, reported the disappearance of many roosts, declines in numbers of bats at roosts, incidences of bats being killed in large numbers by deliberate extermination, and a number of different factors, other factors leading to um, declines in bat populations, including landscape and habitat loss, remedial timber treatment, insecticide poisoning and declines in insect prey and this survey um, really contributed to the protection of bats in the UK. Um, by the mid-90s the UK bat conservation movements had become incredibly extensive and this was thanks in no small part to the formation of local bat groups across the UK. Uh, Around right about the same time bat detecting technology um, also became much more affordable for volunteers so it's much easier for um, anyone to um, buy, afford a bat detector. And this enabled the National Bat Monitoring Programme to be established by the Bat Conservation Trust and for the first time it, we could collect detailed data on bat populations at a UK scale. Uh, we run a number of different surveys that volunteers can take part in including roost emergence counts, this is for anyone who knows of a roost they can count, walk surveys using bat detectors and hibernation counts by licensed surveyors. And we also have a survey for complete beginners, um, the Sunset Sunrise Survey, which doesn't require any special equipment to take part. And this map shows the cumulative volunteer coverage since the MBMP began. And to date, uh, 4,874 volunteers have carried out more than 82,000 surveys across more than 8,000 sites. It's an incredible um, volunteer effort and without um, 
this amazing effort from volunteers, this amazing contribution, we just wouldn't be able to monitor how bats are now faring. Okay, so I'll now look at how the species I looked at at the beginning have been faring over the last 20 years based on data collected through the National Bat Monitoring Programme. So starting with the horseshoe bats, well, the good news is that both horseshoe bat species have shown statistically significant increases in the UK in the last 20 years. And factors are likely to include the concerted conservation of these species and their roosts, and possibly also warmer winters, um, which has favoured um, overwinter survival of these species. So how has the greater mouse bat fared after being declared extinct in the UK in 1990? Well, a single, as uh, Lisa mentioned earlier in her talk, a single juvenile male was found during a hibernation survey in the south of England in winter 2002-2003 and has been recorded annually ever since. And this is the only individual of this species currently known to occur in the UK. It's possible that it spends the summer on the continent where this species is still more established and migrates to its regular hibernation site in England. Um, and it's not thought to be a breeding species in the UK uh, for obvious reasons. Then the nocturnal. Um, the nocturnal trend has fluctuated a bit over the last 20 years. Um, currently it appears to be picking up slightly after a after signs of a decline between 2008 and 2013. Um, the population index does not show a statistically significant change from the baseline year of 1999. So we're, we're not really seeing any obvious signs of recovery um, to, to historic levels. It may be that the, at the UK level, the population is fairly stable, but there is continued evidence of local declines, for example, in London. And onto our most familiar species, the common and the soprano pipistrel. Uh, the good news is that the common pipistrel is showing a steady increase in its population over the last 20 years. The soprano pipistrel isn't showing such obvious signs of an increase. Um, this may be because it is more of a habitat specialist, so it would struggle more with habitat loss. Uh, despite both species being often found in urban areas, a recent study showed that their populations are negatively impacted by higher levels of urbanisation. So here are all the UK, the resident UK species, the 17 breeding species and the non-breeding species, the greater mouse bat. This is a summary of um, what, we're, what we're able to report on, on their trends. We're currently able to produce population trends for 11 of the UK's 17 breeding species. As we've seen, a few species are showing increases in their populations, while others appear to have stable populations. There is some uncertainty about some of these trends, and um, trend summaries in brackets are the ones where there, a bit of caution is needed with interpreting the trend for various different reasons. Um, some species we uh, since yet to have trends for. Um, some species are quite difficult to monitor, particularly the woodland habitat specialists, um, which might be more vulnerable species because they are habitat specialists. So it's not clear how these, these species are faring, and we're currently exploring and helping develop new methods for monitoring these species. So to summarise the current situation for the UK's bats, um, factors contributing to increases in some species populations include the legal protection of bats and their roosts since 1981, extensive conservation action, uh, education of the public and industry. However, bat populations are not thought to have recovered to the levels they were at before the major declines in the last 50 to 100 years. And um, while there are positive signs, the picture is less clear for how woodland specialist bat species and other rare species are faring. And as Lisa mentioned earlier, many pressures remain, including roost loss, habitat loss and fragmentation, urbanisation, increases in lighting and uh, dwindling levels of insect prey and several other factors. 
However, everyone, anyone can take part in helping monitor bats in your local area. And it's so exciting going out and discovering what bats occur near you and um, getting these, these results, results to the National Bat Monitoring Programme. Um, and the survey, as I meant, the programme, as I mentioned earlier, includes surveys suitable for all level, levels of experience from total beginners to experts. You can find out more at this web link, or if you simply Google NBMP, then you will come to our homepage. Um, obviously, surveying is on hold for the moment during the current situation, but please do sign up and we'll be in touch with all, all our volunteers as, as the situation develops and um, people can go out surveying again. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, it's really interesting and I just, I also just want to flag up just how amazing the contribution is from the volunteers that year after year um, get that data so we can understand um, population trends for, um, for, the, for our British bats. So um, that's fantastic to all those that are taking part. Um, but it's really great. Thank you for everyone that's um, sending in your Q and A's, um, your questions there. That's that's great. I have a couple specific um, for you, Philip. Actually, and um, we've been asked um, that somebody uses iRecord. Is that useful? And can BCT use that information? Um, there is a specific batch recording form on iRecord. Um, so if you look for that. Um, if you go to iRecord and search for batch recording, it'll take you to the specific batch recording form, um, which is um, was set up in collaboration with BCT, and BCT can download all those records. So we can automatically download all those records from, from that form. Um, but there'll be ways that we can access other records as well through NBN, Atlas, and you know, through, through record requests. Perfect. Thank you, Philip. And um, we've also been asked, um, I think this one was from Facebook, actually. Um, so is there any bat detectors you recommend for beginners? Um, yes, I mean, I could say other bat detectors are available, but um, I would say start with a, a heterodyne bat detector. These are the tunable detectors. Um, you can just go out Tune around in your detector, it's a bit like tuning a radio, you'll pick up different species which call at different frequencies. And the cheapest ones start from about £60, um, £90, depending on whether they've got an LED display. Um, if you Google bat detector, I won't sort of do any product placement here, <laughs> but if you Google, Google bat detector, you'll see a range of, of detectors available. Also, you may have seen um, featured on things like Spring Watch, Norton Watch, there are plug-in devices that you can plug into your phone and download an app and these will pick up the bat sounds, display the sonograms on your screen and flash up suggested species ide identification as well. Um, you need to be a bit cautious with those because often they'll get the species identifications right but sometimes because bat calls are quite complex it won't always come with the, the correct species ID so you do need to know a little bit about bat identification to kind of assess um, how reliable the results are. But Google that detector and you will get all sorts of results coming up. Perfect, thank you Philip. I have, um, so just going to bring Lisa back in now. We've got quite a few questions um, and we've got about 10 minutes or so to, to answer as many as possible. Um, so I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to stop, Lisa this might be a good one for you actually, um, about noise pollution and whether that affects bats? Uh, it, it does indeed. Um, there have been various research studies showing the impact of, of noise pollution, um, primarily from, from roads. Um, and we've got some, again, we've got some information on our website, but um, it's shown that there can be an impact on foraging behaviour the closer you get to, to busier roads. So it's definitely an area of focus. Um, quite Interestingly, some researchers in Spain have been using the situation with lockdown to try and do some before, during, and I assume some after um, analysis as far as they've, they've been able to. So it will be interesting to see whether they find something coming out of the current situation to, to support that as well. But, but noise, and, and it's also worth bearing in mind, noise near bat roost can have an implication. Um, and there's also vibrations through, through structures too. So yeah, noise, noise can have an impact. So, um 
And we've got one that you kind of mentioned this, Philip, in your, your talk, but um, it's really good that we're seeing some positive trends for some of our, our bat species. Um, you've been asked, do they, in light of this, do they still need the same protections? Yes, I think that's really important. because I think the increases we're seeing are, are showing that the protection definitely has a benefit. I think the legal protection of bats and their roosts and also the ongoing conservation efforts. Because although, I mean, it's encouraging that we're seeing results from, from the legal protection and all these efforts, there's still huge amounts of challenge, you know, some challenges and, um, you know, challenges that bats face and pressures on their population. And these aren't going away and some are increasing. In fact, you know, there's constant increase in kind of road building developments and that sort of thing, urbanization, um, roost loss, roost conversion, that sort of thing. So. Um, it's vitally important and I think you know we'd probably be feeling a bit discouraged if we weren't seeing increases considering there's the legal protection and all this conservation effort but um, yes we are you know it's really important that this does continue. Fantastic thank you um, and another quite a big big topic here um, and I don't know um, either of you could take this one actually but how is a big topic how does climate change affect our bats and um, hibernation timings for example? Okay, this is quite a challenging one, and yes, I'm not sure I can give the perfect answer. I'll give a few bits of information. So, I did mention one potential benefit for the horseshoe bats. Um, it's possible that warmer winters have been possibly one factor behind the increase in their populations. Um, there are a few species that can be a bit more active in the winter time. They might forage a bit more in suitable conditions. So perhaps horseshoe bats are just foraging a bit more in the winter. Um, but I think it's going to be mixed for different species. Um, there's probably going to be changes in the range of different species in response to climate change. It might be that some species can't really adapt because there isn't the connectivity to enable them to actually move with climate change to suitable habitats further north. Um, might be differences in I don't know, prey availability, um, differences in hibernation patterns which might be actually detrimental for some species. Um, so I think that there's definitely going to be changes but we're probably going to see new species in the UK that are moving from the continent that are, that are able to, to kind of move with climate change uh, but we're you know there's a good chance that we'll see some losses as well so things are certain to change but um, yes I think you need more of an expert on the subject to really give a comprehensive answer. <laughs> well, it's a big it's a big topic isn't it it's a big area of research a huge area um, so I'm actually going to Lisa now on for you just about um, how can we help um, and how can we make our gardens for example more bat friendly? Oh do, does BCT have the leaflet for you? Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's quite a lot we can do um, uh, a fabulous bat worker Shirley Thompson always talks about bats needing bed and board um, so what we can do is make sure that we've got bed provision so things like bat boxes etc but equally bats need to feed and drink so we can't uh, sadly in the UK we can't put out feeders for our bats like those who have nectar feeders can do so we have to plant things that encourage the insects into our gardens that bats um, will feed on and support those insect populations so um, there's a whole variety of different things that you, you, you can plant and sort of open flowers things that are going to attract night flying night flying insects and we've got a great leaflet stars of the night or encouraging bats on the BCT website that sets out details but bats also need to drink so another thing you can do if you are lucky enough to have the space is put in a garden pond and, and that's great because it will attract insects but it will also give um, an area for bats to dip down to and, and have a drink over and there's there's various um, anecdotal evidence that will show that they'll use you know relatively small garden ponds of, of a couple of meters or so I know not everyone has the space to do that but but if you do that's a really great thing you can do for bats and other wildlife too. Fantastic thank you Lisa um, and as you've got I can see the the fantastic library behind you <laughs> is, um, you're the best person to ask this about so um, which field guides would you recommend? Oh, that's a good question. You know, someone was asking us something very similar uh, just the other day. Um, oh, all of them. No, no, seriously. Um, I guess it depends on what you want to use it for. So um, there are simple things, and, and also your budget, of course. There are simple things like an FSC fold-out. Um, can I get props? Yeah, please do. <laughs> so, like the FSC. I think it's my favourite. Show my favourite. Oh, is that the, that's the soft one? Yeah. yeah. 
That's oh, written in Europe by Christian Dietz and Andreas Kiefer. Kiefer. It's fantastic, yeah. This one's, this one's a bit heavier and you wouldn't want to take out in the field, yeah. but the one that you're showing, Phil, it's actually still in print, isn't it? That's, yes, it's yeah. stunning, stunning illustrations. It covers all the maps in Europe. It talks about identifying them from the echolocation calls, um, flight patterns. If you're more specialist, then identifying in the hand. Obviously, only specialists should um, handle bats. Um, that's really good. Um, if you're doing sound analysis, if you're recording sounds, then this back calls by John Russ is really good. And there's a, another book in this in this publisher on social calls as well. So, but um, I mean, this is a really really good read. Um, but of course, other field guides are available. Yeah. And if you're if you are just starting out and budget's an issue, and maybe you're just getting your first bat detector, this is the the fold out sheet. And you know the pictures are great. Excuse the bare hands. The pictures are good, but actually the most useful bit of this, and bearing in mind this is only about three quid, is the information on on the back. I don't know how well you can you can see that, but it includes species range, so where you're likely to find them. And you know we have we have a range of bats all the way down from the Isles of Scilly all the way up into the Orkneys. You just sort of Orkney might have just one species but it tells you species range it's got flight pattern so if you're just starting out um that and, and a heptadyne back detector um brilliant perfect okay so i think we have time for probably um just the last two questions here um so we've been asked by liz kitch um is there any evidence that insecticidal spray used by timber boring insects affects our bats mm. um yeah, well, yeah. Um, so this is um, one of the reasons, and in fact, the horseshoe bats got protection before our other bat species. One of the reasons was because of a chemical that was used in house timbers in attics called lindane. And the problem was it, it stayed on the timbers and stayed active. So even if it was applied when bats weren't present, when they came back into the roost, the bats could could absorb um, the pesticides, and it caused serious. Um, issues. So the use of chemicals in bat roosts is, is strictly controlled um, and there are products that are suitable for use in bat roosts now but not when the bats are present. So through the National Bat Helpline advice is available to people on what are the treatments to use, when they can be used um, and if you're a householder that can be through, if you're a householder in England that's through the Natural England Volunteer Bat Roost Visitor Service and there are similar services services in Scotland and Wales and, and Northern Ireland as well to get that important advice. So yes, it can have an impact, but there are the right chemicals available and the right timing is what's critical now. Thank you. Um, we've had lots of questions actually about where you get those FSC fold out leaflets. <laughs> <laughs> you can get them in all sorts of places. So some Organ some retailers if they sell bat detectors will do a beginner's kit and they'll throw that in and some batteries um, as well as the detector you can order them straight from fsc from their online shop um, you quite often when we're allowed out to play again and shops are open you can quite often find them at the shops on local nature reserves if they have one in a cafe so they're available in all sorts of all sorts of places um, i think even certain online retailers retailers that shall remain anonymous um, provide them so um, I can if you just google FSC it's called um, um, a guide to British bats so if you just google FSC a guide to British bats it'll bring up um, and I, I think they're £3.50 something like that £3.4 yeah. something like that. Um, okay then so the last last question then that we have time for today um, is actually about the weather and how the weather affects um, our, our bats. <laughs> okay. Well, obviously bats, they feed on insect prey, um, but most of them are feeding on aerial insects or flying insects. And the weather obviously has a big impact on that. Um, so they won't be going out when it's very wet and very windy. Well, when it's windy, they'll be in more shelter spots, but very heavy rain, they won't be out. Um, so they like a nice, still, quiet night, um, uh, you know, which won't affect the insect, insect populations too much. Um, I suppose um, it, long spells of bad weather can have a really bad effect on bats, particularly female bats who are having young. Because um, obviously, <clears throat> female bats, we've got a, a bat and a baby inside her. She needs to keep feeding in order to um, in, in order for the, the, the baby to keep developing. 
So if there's a long spell where she can't feed, then, then she will sadly lose the baby. And it's the same once the baby is born, she needs to keep feeding in order to produce milk. So again, it's a long spell of bad weather, so I think several days, um, and she can't produce milk, then again, you know, she'll lose the baby. So, um, you know, possibly has a bigger impact on the females than the males. The males can simply go into a torpor during spells of bad weather, but the females have got this quite high demand for, for having to keep feeding. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, can I just share? We got yeah to please do. Fact there that's relevant to, to what Philip was just saying. <laughs> um, and, and quite right, you know, if it, we've got a prolonged period of bad weather, that uh, at certain times of year, that really does um, mean bad news. But e e evolutionary, our, our native bats have developed such that although they have a typical gestation period um, for, for like our pippin stars that can be around 40 days say that can actually vary depending on how well they're feeding so it can be a little bit shorter but it can also be a little bit longer and I just think that's a, an incredible mm -hmm. adaptation to um, a variable climate so I just wanted to get that in but yeah prolonged bad weather is not 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 great news. Brilliant, thank you. That was really, yeah, really interesting fact there. I like that. Um, <laughs> so, um, that is all we have time for um, the questions today. Thank you so much for um, sending them in. Any questions that we haven't been able to get round to, we will actually continue to answer them via the hashtag Bats and Churches Live. Um, but you can also get in contact with us via um, the face, our Facebook page if you prefer Facebook or via our website, which is www.batsandchurches.org. Um, but I just want to say uh, thank you so much to Lisa and to Philip um, and to everyone here who's, who's joined us. Um, really appreciate it. Um, please do join us again next week. Uh, so next Wednesday at 1 p.m. we'll be talking about um, our church buildings, which are treasure houses of English history. Um, and we'll be joined by Dermot McCulloch, who is a historian, professor, uh, columnist and broadcaster, uh, as well as Rachel Morley, who is the director of the Friends of the Friendless Churches and a guardian of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. Um, and that promises to be a really interesting talk as well. So um, that's, that's it from us today, but I really hope that you'll join us next week. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.